You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again, and today we have another show lined up for y'all. Today, we're going to talk to our special guest, Jamal Javanji. And he is an author, and we're going to talk about his book that I think is going to be very interesting, Living for a Living. He also is a life coach, so we're going to learn all about him. He's doing his thing out in California, West Coast, and we're just going to learn about him, Jamal. So how are you doing, sir? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Man, it's a pleasure to have you, man. And you also, I forgot to say, you're a podcaster as well, so I'll, I'll definitely that you have the honors of talking about the love cast that you do on your podcast show. So thank, thank you so much. Let's talk about you, man, because you're a full-time life coach. What inspired you to write this book, Living for a Living? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, Living for a Living, I like to say, is um, it, it, it originated from a just kind of a pet peeve I've had. You know, over the years, people would ask the question, and we all, we all, understand the question. Sometimes people will say, Hey, what do you do for a living? And, um, the reason that's kind of a sore subject for me, um, is because I grew up, you know, my family, the little bit of my background is I, my dad, uh, was an immigrant to the United States. He, uh, was born and raised in a, a island called Zanzibar, which is on the East coast of Africa. And then he migrated to the United States. Uh, and, uh, he was, he was actually writing to my mother. My mother was from, Southeastern Ohio, kind of an Appalachian area. So both in my f- mother and my father's background, you know, traditionally there was just a lot of poverty. So the, I grew up in a household where the focus was on survival, just get to work really hard just to pay the bills. And I mean, that was really life's focus for my parents. And I appreciate that about them, but there was something in me as a child that, that just, I just was always asking the question, is that it? Is that why we're here? Is there anything more to life than just making a few bucks and paying the bills and surviving? And what I witnessed was with my parents' story is that that's that's you know that's really what was their that was their focus. And when people would ask you know what do you do for a living or what do you want to do for a living, I, I was always hung up on the word living because to me what they were asking what they really are asking is what are you going to do for money, but what you do for money and what you do to actually live may be very different things because survival uh, is a part of life, but to truly be alive and to live is a very different subject. And I was always, I always had the desire. What if I could live for a living as opposed to just living for survival? What does it look like? And so um, that was my lifelong quest took me down a lot of roads, but then I, I initially, I, I eventually discovered that, Actually, not only can we live for a living, that's, that's actually why we're here, which we're here to be fully alive and to do. And when our work in the world is in alignment with what makes us fully alive, then we're living for a living. Well, and that's the idea behind the book. Once again, listen, I'm focused radio talking to our guest, Jamal Javanji. And real quick, man, it shows in your bio that you were able to travel the globe. How many places have you traveled towards and talked? A little bit about that. I think that's interesting. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I, I'm a, I spent a lot of time. French is my second language, uh, just out of desire. So I've spent some time. I've had some some folks I've connected with in Switzerland, the French part of Switzerland, and then France. So I've spent a lot of time over there over the years. I've uh, been to Africa. Uh, so my, as I mentioned, my father's side of the family is from East Africa, um, originally from India, her- heritage wise from India, but several generations, uh, they, uh, previous, they moved to Zanzibar and settled there. So I have family in Tanzania and also Kenya. So I've been there to visit them. I've been to West Africa, a country called Cameroon, which is a French speaking part of West Africa, spent some time in Egypt, um, the middle East, Jordan, Israel, uh, West Bank areas, uh, then spent some time in uh, China, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Tibet, Nepal, India. So kind of all over um, that part of the world. And uh, just, just every time I, I travel, it just it helps you see that the world is um, diverse in many ways, but in many ways, 
people are people. And the same, what I learned from my travels is that we all have the same core desires, the same things that, um, that, that, uh, that I desire is the same thing that people desire all over the world. And, um, everybody's trying to meet those desires and to be fully alive. And, uh, even though, and then I've been able to appreciate the diversity, you know, of the cultures and, um, to see the thing that unifies us all is our, our common heritage is that we are all life. Um, and, and this, and this and life desires to live. So it's been a fascinating, fascinating journey. That experience to be able to travel, was that funded with like your career, your, your day job, your entrepreneurship? What was it that came first? Well, a lot of it honestly came out of my quest and desire to see life outside of my context, outside of a Western context. So initially, uh, much of it was just wanting to understand uh, my own, my own heritage. So I, that uh, my first trip out of the country was to East Africa, which is where my dad uh, was born and raised. And I, I don't, I don't know if I was always conscious of this, but I had a deep desire to understand what would cause, cause my dad had a very, I grew up, you know, and he, you know, I grew up here in the States, born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so, you know, I'm Western uh, in my, in my, framework of how I was taught to view the world, but my dad saw the world so differently. And honestly, I look back on that. There was a lot of trauma for him because he grew up in a lot of poverty or around a lot of poverty. And so that caused an existential anxiety in him. So I went, I initially traveled uh, to, to that part of the world to better understand him. And so um, I would just prepare, I would, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people save money for, <laughs> Uh, a vacation or, you know, uh, another car or whatever, I would just put money away to travel. Cause that's what I realized is when I would get on a plane and go to a different part of the world, there was an energy that just boosted me. And uh, I always in my book, living for a living, I talk about that, pay attention to what causes your energy to spike because there's, there's something for you in that. And traveling has always been that way for me. So uh, yeah, just um, it, you know, I've done a lot of jobs over the years before I got into this world of coaching and, uh, being an author. Um, but I always made it a priority to travel when I could. I know someone this right now is like, man, how in the world did he fund all of that to go to different places? Cause it's one thing to go to one place outside the United States, but it's a different thing. We're able to be fortunate to see other places around the world. Cause not everybody is, if you will, has the resources to have the ability to enjoy that. But that said, it makes total sense now that I know that you work multiple jobs and you purposely invested into your traveling. So that is very interesting because someone listening, what would you give as far as wisdom, words of wisdom based on your experience? Some of the things that they should take advantage of when they do travel to experience different cultures. Uh, yeah, well, I always tell people what we think is impossible because I would get that question a lot, asked a lot, a lot when I would travel. They, you know, even even when I was in Europe or whatever, people that I would meet along the way, they'd say, you know, I wish I could travel the world. Uh, maybe someday when I retired, when I when I retired, when I have more time and money on my hands. But I've never considered myself, um, especially when I was doing a lot of those travels, I never considered myself to be privileged or have to have extra resources that other people didn't have. Um, it's just that I in my mind, I say, you will do what you set your, what you've put your focus on. If you can start visualizing a trip and start picturing that and just putting it into your mind, uh, you'll do it. You'll end up taking those trips because that's where we're, you know, there's a principle here in the coaching where we always talk about where focus goes, energy flows. If you can start picturing it, uh, you, it can be done. All things are literally possible. I mean, literally, you know, for the price uh, of a Starbucks um, latte, if you will to put that amount of money back every day um, over the course of 30 days, over the course of 12 months, over the course of five years, you have, um, you have a great, you have, you'll have plenty of resources to travel the entire world. <laughs> and if you're, if you really want to travel, and I always say this, you know, um, be open to other experiences. I remember when, on my first trip uh, overseas to to East Af East Africa. Well, actually, when we went to Egypt, I remember we it was a three month trip, and we did it. Uh, we strung a bunch of countries together. We stayed in hostels, and some of those hostels were two dollars a night. Now it wasn't luxury staying, <laughs> but we wanted to experience uh, life as it 
as everybody else in that area experienced it. So we, we traveled on buses and trains and we, we did, we didn't do the tourist thing. So, uh, when, when you decide to do that, <laughs> financially speaking, a lot of things are possible. Most of the world lives on about $2 a day. So if you're willing to do that, you can live that way as well. Once again, talking to our guest, Jamal Javanji and man, that see, that opens up my eyes. Cause that's a great point where you just illustrated for us. Like if you put it in motion with <laughs> imagining it is possible. Instead of you visualizing the coffee at Starbucks, now it's like, okay, I'm going to put that aside and that's going to go towards my fund for this trip or that trip. Now, in talking about your your book, I think this kind of goes hand in hand because you're talking about, you know, our mindset as as people. So when it comes to living for living, based on what you just shared with your story about traveling and how it is possible, how we can change our way of thinking of what we look at things being possible or impossible. How does this book help also illustrate for the reader that it's the mindset too, as well? Absolutely. Well, one of the things the book um, addresses is our relationship with money specifically, because we all have a relationship with money. Um, whether we're, sometimes we don't think of it as a relationship. We tend to think of relationships as being with other people, but a relationship is how you, I mean, I, my understanding of the word relationship is just, it's the manner in which you connect with something or relate to something. So what is money? A lot of, we're taught, and this is a very strange concept. You know, most people, even though money is making most of the decisions or how we acquire money and what we do with money is making most of the decisions for our life. Very few people, and I've discovered this, have actually taken the time to sit down and really think about what is it? What actually is money? Is it just these, you know, at one point it was just, is it just paper? Is it just markings on paper? Is it just some metal coins? What actually is it? And what I've discovered about money is that what I was taught about money, everything I was taught about money was fundamentally incorrect. Um, I was taught that money is scarce, that money is hard to come by that you have to work really hard for it. And most of the time that won't be enough. And I've just realized it's just not the case because money at the core, at the, at the end of the day, um, especially here in the West, money is actually determined by a group of about seven people that sit on a board. We call it the federal reserve board. It's a board of governors. At one point in time, money was, was, was precious metal, right? It was, it was gold for the most part. You know, we, we would say, okay, gold is valuable. And what makes gold valuable? Well, people, people say what has value. Literally, it's just human agreement. When people, whatever people agree on has value, it has value. That means we're giving it value. So when somebody said gold is valuable and that's our currency, it became our currency. Well, after, you know, you can't really, if you're traveling on horseback and, you know, in previous generations, you can't really haul gold around <laughs> very, very long. It's dangerous. People could take it. It's very heavy. So what people did is they would take that gold and put it in a safety deposit box in a bank and a bank would then issue a piece of paper and say, okay, this, this piece of paper represents a certain measure of this gold that you have in your safety deposit box, your bank account, so to speak. So then paper money was invented to to be representative of gold. Well, now, you know, we're no longer on the gold standard. So now, the money that's issued and printed by the Federal Reserve is simply based upon whatever this these this group of people says it's based upon, whether it's gross domestic product or based upon certain economic indicators. They say, okay, that's determined or and the value and how it compares to other currencies. Basically, these these this board of governors is simply inventing out of thin air what money is and how much it's worth. So I say all that to say, what does that mean, right? Uh, well, the word currency is what we use for money, but the word currency, the root word of currency is current. And the root word of current is energy. This is what we're talking about. Is we're talking about energy. So an economy is simply an exchange of energy. It's a giving and receiving. So really what money is, money is a story that we're telling about an exchange of energy. So, and I know this may sound kind of heady here, but I'm going somewhere with this. We know this from physics 101 that everything is energy. Literally everything in the universe is made up of energy and energy cannot be created or destroyed. It simply changes form and it's like breathing, right? When, you know, none of us have been trained to think about air. Like if someone came to us as a child and said, 
how much air have you been breathing today? It, there may not be enough air. You would, it would really affect you. You know, you wouldn't be able to breathe, but we never think about that with air. We assume that there's plenty of air. We don't look at just the air in our quote unquote uh, lung account. You know, if we just look at the air in our lungs, we may get scared. We may feel like there's not enough air in the lungs. Right. But we don't see air that way. We see air, whether it's in our lungs or outside the lungs, we see air as plentiful and supply almost endless. So therefore we take in what we need. And then we obviously exhale what we, what we don't need. So there's, a, there's an economy going on in breathing. There's a giving and a receiving. It's very smooth. And the reason it's smooth is because we, it's built upon the fundamental premise that there is plenty, that is infinite in supply. Well, I always say this, energy is infinite supply, right? There's no more or less energy in any given day. There's all the energy that exists already exists. So we have a relationship with that energy. The problem with money is that most people have been conditioned to think that money is limited in supply. And that's like saying energy is limited in supply, but that's incorrect. Everything is energy and there is no energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes form. So when we, when we change the fundamental premise of what we think and how we understand money, that's when life starts to change because most of our decisions are based upon where, where people are traumatized. Their, their relationship with money is, is very tense. And so people are operating um, as if, um, you know, and there's a lot of implications to this. If you, if you feel like there's not enough money to go around, that will cause you to be in resistance to life. That's what causes stress, which causes us to stay stuck in survival mode. And it really prevents us from creating our life the way we would naturally create it if there was no lack of resources. It's like having a show, the energy mm -hmm. of the show, when you're talking to the guests and the guests are talking to you, you create that energy, you create that moment. And I have plenty mm -hmm. of people who be on the show and they kind of say the same common uh, idea. And that is when you live in the moment and you live in the now, then that's when the best memories are made because you're, you're letting go of the past and you're not judging anything based on the past. You're judging, you're not even judging anything. You're basically just living right now. And that's when you can have good memories and you create amazing moments within time. Mm -hmm. And then with podcasting shows, you get to paint that picture audio format for the, for the audience. And so now they really engage into you, Jamal, on the show because stories and time and how you just illustrate everything with your words, boom, it's in the moment. Absolutely. And we're creating, creating in this moment and, and what the next moment will be. I like to tell people, whatever the future is going to be is being created in this moment. And you'll never experience the future outside of this moment. Exactly. Everything happens in this moment and it's beautiful. And, and in this moment, there's abundance, right? Everything we need for life to be sustained in this moment is here right now. And, and that takes us out of survival mode. Once we can pay attention to the quality and nature of life in this moment, it's very abundant and everything's possible in this moment, because again, there's no future. Uh, the future can be whatever, whatever we do, what, what, you know, however we perceive it in this moment. But uh, the, 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 what's causing so much human suffering is not the future, even though people, the imagination of the future, this is where stress comes from, right? This is where we perceive. I always tell people there, every problem that you, every problem that you have is always in the future. If you think about it, it's always, whether it's five minutes in the future or an hour into the future, it's always rooted in the future, but the future doesn't exist. So where are we getting this imagination of the future? Well, the mind, what the mind does is it, it draws from the past it draws from what we've experienced previously. And this is why our, our perception of the future feels very limited so often to, to people. And then we feel afraid of the future because the past is, is, is the reservoir that we're drawing from. But if we can learn how to disconnect from this, the past programming, the past experiences that we've, that we've experienced, if we can learn to disconnect or create a little bit of distance between the past and this moment. What happens is this moment when it's not colored by the past begins to, there's a sense of the, everything's possible in this moment, the, the, whatever, there's no limitation, then it's a matter of create. And that's when the creative energy starts to flow and everything that's invented, you know, you, whether it's from planes to 
uh, to cars, to technology. At one point, this did not exist. And we had to break from the past to even create these things. And um, that's still true, right? Uh, it, so infinite possibilities exist when we learn to dial into this moment. You listen to Iron Reef Focus Radio talking to our guest, Jamal Javanji, and his book that we're discussing, Living for a Living. You also m- mention and explore and break down for us in the book your true purpose, that big why. And it's not just why, but you break it down. And when people read your book, what do you what do you hope they take away as far as action steps for them to practice in their own life because it's one thing to read something great but it's another thing to put it in application you're actually living it and not just quoting it Mm. Uh, yeah absolutely well i I always say this about about especially the the books i've written i always say my intention for the book is to be a the starting point Uh, books don't transform your life exactly as you said there has to be practical application uh, to this information for it to actually make a difference in our, in our everyday experience. So I always say the book is a, is the entrance point. It's a beginning of a conversation. It's certainly not the end, but one of the, in regards to purpose specifically, I'll just tell you a little bit how purpose affected me. Just, uh, there was a point in my life that I went through some really, really difficult, really difficult season. And to the point where I, um, I really didn't even want to live. I would say I was suicidal, but, uh, I didn't even have the energy for that. I had, I was just completely at the end of my rope. And I, if I could have just pushed a button to end my life, I totally would. And, uh, when I was in this deep, dark depression, I, I heard a voice and it was this inner kind of knowing, not a voice like you audibly hear, but it was like an inner, um, direction, a guidance from what I would, my understanding is that's, it was the divine voice coming to me. And what I heard was since you're done with life and you want to die, why don't you do some research on people that have actually died and been resuscitated and had experiences called near death experiences. Why don't you research those folks? And as soon as I heard that, it was the first thing that really, it seemed to lift me out of my my depressive state, I started, I just became obsessed. I started doing all this research on folks who have had near death experiences. I ended up reading a book written by a medical doctor. It was called life after life. And this medical doctor documented about a hundred folks that he could verify had clinically died, had experiences that went beyond the body that could be verified. And uh, they were accurate experiences that could be verified, but they would have no way of knowing uh, because they were clinically dead. So he'd researched them and he'd started telling their stories. So I, when I was researching their stories and listening to their stories, everybody, everybody's experience was slightly different, but there were some commonalities, common themes. And one of the common themes in everybody's story was that they were, something was communicated to them after they left their body and they were in this other dimension, having this experience, what was communicated to them was you, this isn't your time. Like you're, you're not, you're not, you can't stay. You need to go back to your body, to, to this life you have on earth, because there's a purpose for your existence. You are here on purpose. There's something, there are things you're here to learn. There's things you're here to do. And this is true of everybody. And uh, when I heard that, it just floored me. And these folks that have had this experience, they were profoundly different uh, after they were resuscitated you know, and got their life back. It totally changed their life. Now, most of those folks didn't know their what that purpose, it wasn't told to them, this is your purpose, right? Uh, They didn't know that. But the fact is that they knew from that point on, they knew they have a purpose. And how this affected me was, it showed me that I'm here on purpose. My life, there are no throwaway days. There are no mundane days. If I'm here, if I wake up today, it's because there is a purpose for me to be here today. And a lot of people in my coaching work, a lot of people say, I really don't know my purpose. I feel lost. I, I want to discover it. And I I always like to say this, like your purpose isn't lost. Actually, my understanding is that your purpose gave birth to you. Everybody's purpose, everybody's purpose is to live. I say, is it not, aren't we here to have this experience to be fully alive? So the beginnings of our purpose is literally to learn how to, how to interact with my life today, because Stress is simply, people talk a lot about stress, but what is stress? It's simply inner resistance to the way life is in this moment. So if I'm resisting life, 
I can't have this experience. I can't be fully present, dialed in, having this very experience. If I'm drinking a cup of coffee, in order to really enjoy that cup of coffee, I have to be very present with it. You know, if I'm going to enjoy this meal, I got to be very present with it. If I'm going to enjoy my relationship, I have to be very present with it. Well, if I'm in resistance to life, that's going to be very difficult. So just understanding that you're the fact that you exist, that you're here, that you're still alive means there is a profound purpose to it. And that is to have this experience. Just knowing that is a game changer. And it's really how we can start moving into living from survival to actually living for a living by understanding like, what would you do if you had a lot of money, right? A lot of people say, if I just had X amount of dollars, that'd be great. Well, what would you do? Well, a lot of times people will say, well, I would... <laughs> I would, I would travel, right? Okay. Well, I would enjoy my relationships. Great. I would uh, eat good food. Great. Well, don't wait for that. You can, you don't actually need money to do that. You can start doing that immediately because we have food today. We have relationships today. Um, We actually travel today. If you can take a walk, if you can take a drive, you're traveling, enjoy what you're seeing, take it all in. This is what, this is literally how we transition. A lot of people think we need money to do this. Money follows focus, um, but, but focus can begin immediately. Man, that's some good stuff. I had to listen to this myself, man. But uh, when people are reading the book, also, you also point towards this whole idea that working super hard is actually like the norm because everyone's like hey let me just outwork you let me outwork the next guy oh he's going to do this well let me do this why is it important the way you explain the book that that actually can lead to more troubles versus actually uh more success yeah yeah absolutely uh so the hard work uh, i talk about in the book yeah the hard work work myth um now that a lot of people I know that sometimes gets people's attention. They say, what do you mean? Don't you have to work hard? Well, so working hard is a quality, right? It's a quality. It's a way I'm, exp- now, if I experience work, what I, if I'm doing something and it feels difficult for me or hard, then that means I have a level of resistance to it, right? Now, <laughs> I remember hearing, I think it was Bill Belichick, the coach of the uh, NFL um New England Patriots, right? And uh, I think it was a press conference one time and they they referred to his job as going to work. And he said, and he like kind of snapped at him. And he said, what do you mean? He's like, I don't go to work. He's like, this, you think this is work? He's like, this is play. He's like, I'm a coach. I coach a football team. Is it is it a lot of work? Well, it's a lot of hours and it's a lot of involvement. He said, but I love this. I love it. It's fantastic. And so for him, it's not work. It, somebody else may look at it and go, man, I don't know how this guy does this, puts all this time and energy into it. But see, when when something is joyful, when you're in a joyful state, you're going to give your attention to something. Other people may call that work, but that's not work. <laughs> it's, it doesn't feel like resistance. Now, it may, call, it may take a lot of focus and involvement and, and energy, but if you do something without resistance, you can be dialed in, fully present for a long period of time. And, 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 and you don't burn out, right? So this hard work ethic, this hard work myth is we're, we're kind of taught, and this is how I was brought up, you know, you got to really grind and it's got to feel really hard just to make it. And then of course, people are burning out and then they're looking for escapes. And this is where drugs and alcohol come in and, and uh, you know, all kinds of illicit things because people are trying to escape or take a vacation from their life. I always say, we want to create a life that we don't have to take a vacation from. And that's, that's, that's the possibility that exists uh, when we start to understand that, you know, when your, your work is in alignment with your passion and desires, it doesn't feel like hard work, even though it may be very involved and require a lot of focus and energy. It's not, it's not wearing you down. And uh, uh, that's what's possible for us. You've been listening to I Am Refocus Radio, talking to our guest, Jamal Javanji. You can go to his website, jamaljavanji.com, and you can get his book on Amazon, Living for a Living, and I'm sure you can get it anywhere that you can buy books. Man, I know we uh, are short on time, but before we let you go, you do life coaching as well. Someone listen right now, and they can potentially be a, a good fit for, for you or you for them, however you want to phrase it. How, what's the best way for them to get in touch? and learn more about your services. Absolutely. Well, 
my website's probably the best way for people to get in touch with you know my coaching coaching work. Uh, obviously, I have a podcast uh, called the Love Cast with Jamal. All of those resources and the book, as you mentioned, all of that is available on my on my personal website, which is jamaljavanji.com. Awesome, man. Well, man, it's been a very great discussion on, on this talk, and I hope people take this and, and run with it, man. I want to say thank you for taking time, your busy schedule, talk to the Army Focus Radio, man. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.